Thank you, but I'll just introduce, introduce Moksha Canada Foundation and what we're all about uh, for our viewers when they do see that after we launch uh, the week of April 21st. These 28 weeks will air from now until September, so each segment will kind of build up uh, to the next theme. So yeah, we're quite fortunate to have wonderful people like yourselves. Um, so welcome to all of our viewers today and to our guest, Fania, who is here, part of the Spotlight and Community, uh, which is uh, sponsored through Moksha Canada Foundation. And we're really thrilled to be here today starting this um, uh, starting this uh, panel. We've got great guests. I can't wait to talk about them, uh, have them introduce themselves. Uh, so Spotlight and Community, we are talking about domestic violence, um, a heavy-handed topic. Uh, we did really want to address that for our community and bring in some experts to, to share with us their knowledge and educate us along the way um, uh, about the, about um, uh, you know, doesn't domestic violence and other questions pertaining to launch right into Moksha Canada and what we're all about and Spotlight on Community. Moksha Canada Foundation is excited to launch this new program. It is Spotlight on Community. We've been running for a few weeks for some of our programs. Uh, the purpose of the program is to raise awareness and find creative ways to address issues that affect our diverse communities across Canada. Moksha Canada Foundation is a registered not-for-profit community organization that works towards ensuring the well-being of individuals, families, and diverse communities in Canada. We in Moksha Canada believe in the philosophy of connect, create, and participate. And that's why we're here today for Spotlight and Community to, to participate. Uh, thank you to our guests for being here. Um, I'll have uh, Jensen uh, start first, and maybe perhaps you can just introduce yourself, Jensen, uh, and then we'll launch into Sarah, and uh, she can tell us where she's from as well. Jensen, welcome, Jensen Williams. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. My name is Jensen Williams. I use she and they pronouns, and I'm the public educator for Guelph Falling to Minute Crisis. And in my role, I focus on utilizing the power of education in violence prevention. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next up, Sarah. Uh, from my name is Guelph Sarah Bowers Peter. I'm the program coordinator for Crime Stoppers Guelph Wellington. Crime Stoppers is a not for profit charitable organization that works as an intermediary between the public and the police as a way to anonymously and confidentially report crime. Awesome. Thank you for coming. Really appreciate that. Um, Anya, could you introduce yourself, please? Hi everyone, I'm Hanya. I'm a blogger and YouTuber and I've been participant in some of the Youth for Change programs like Community on Spotlight and Women Mentoring Women. They're amazing programs and I love attending those. Yes. And our Moksha Canada Foundation founder, Sunil Chanan. <laughs> uh, so he's here for support for us today and really appreciate our panel being here for this spotlighting community. We have um, guests that come and go for our different themes. So you may have somebody drop in on the subject throughout our, our discussion to, today as well. Um, yeah, so we're focusing on domestic violence. And I wondered, Jensen, if we could start out with you, if you don't mind, because I know we've spoken about this before. Uh, our viewers are across Canada. Um, you're coming from the Guelph region. If you could just speak about your work as an educator. Uh, and perhaps maybe even just defining for, for us what domestic violence is and what is, the, um, what is the definition of that for anyone who may not even know or is just being educated along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for my role in uh, Guelph Wine Women in Crisis, uh, we're a feminist community-based organization that provides programs and services to those who've experienced and whose lives have been touched by gender-based violence. Uh, and so the work that we do is primarily around sexual violence, domestic violence, and human trafficking. Uh, and in my role as the public educator, uh, we really believe that education is a powerful tool in transforming uh, the behaviors and actions of society members that perpetuate gender-based violence. So we focus on education for youth all the way up to seniors and hoping that by having a greater amount of education around uh, healthy relationships, consent, boundaries, then we're better able to uh, equip folks with the skills needed to uh, stop gender-based violence. Um, and so for domestic violence, uh, domestic violence is uh, also known as intimate partner violence, uh, and it is important to note that it is a serious crime and that it involves any use of physical or sexual force uh, by a partner or former partner. Um, and it's important to note when we talk about domestic violence that it can happen to anyone, uh, regardless of race, age, socioeconomic status, their level of education, and it's committed primarily by men towards women. However, um, Domestic violence can be committed by women towards men and also occurs in same-sex relationships, uh, but women are disproportionately impacted as those who experience domestic violence. 
And so it can take many forms, as I mentioned, uh, physical and sexual violence, uh, but it can also take the form of verbal abuse, physical and emotional abuse, uh, economic abuse. And while these are not all considered uh, criminal offenses, uh, these forms of abuse are very serious. And um, it's important to note too that domestic violence often happens in a pattern. So it's rarely a one-time incident. Uh, it's rarely just one type of violence. It's oftentimes uh, a lot of different aspects of violence that are working together. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that, for the intro there. Anya, did you want to jump in with a question at all for, for Jensen right away? Or, uh, oh, we... no, no, no. I You're was okay? listening. Yeah, yeah for, for sure. Maybe, is there, is there anything you wanted to jump in on there to kind of add to a point or uh, reference anything to Jensen, what she's saying? Well, actually, uh, as far as our role within Crime Stoppers, we, we've adopted a more a progressive and, and uh, community-based engagement because of exactly the things that Jensen has expressed there. We know that there's uh, that it's happening, that it's underreported. Uh, there's a lot of shame involved with this type of crime where the victims don't feel that they themselves can come forward. And that's where Crime Stoppers is able to really help because if you are aware of someone being the victim of a domestic violence incident, uh, you can take action on their behalf and no one will know it's you. Um, I'm going to jump in with a lot of that type of information, yeah, but yes, absolutely. we're so proud of our partnership with uh, Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis because of the amazing work that they do and the fact that the reporting aspect from our end really works so well with the awareness that Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis and of course the support that they're providing to their, their clients as well. Mm -hmm. Jensen, could you speak to uh, what do you need to be equipped with as a professional for you going into that field? And then maybe we can kind of take off from there, if you don't mind. Um... Yeah, for sure. I think for myself in my role, uh, a strong background in public speaking, uh, a strong background in the knowledge of the issues that we deal with, such as sexual domestic violence and human trafficking, um, the ability to connect with with community partners and building those relationships is really key to the work that I do. Um, but as well, in terms of the work that we do at our agency, um, we are a strong feminist agency. So obviously a strong belief in gender equality and wanting to utilize education for good, uh, as well as being trauma informed. So recognizing that trauma has impacts everyone in different ways. And so there's no one way to react to trauma. So we have to be able to adapt to meet the individual needs of our clients uh, and recognize them really as the experts of their own experiences. Um, also having a survivor centric mindset. So um, making sure that the survivor is centered in the work that we do and they don't feel as if we're taking um, like a paternalistic role in the work that they're doing towards their healing, but more so that we walk alongside them in their journey. Um, so for the counselors that work with us in terms of their um, background, a lot of them have masters in social work. Uh, that is a, a big thing for our counselors and really just a background in working with uh, marginalized populations, I think is something that would be definitely beneficial uh, to those who are working within our agency. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. Sarah, anything to add? Uh, as far as what's involved in yeah. this role, is that what you're looking for? Yeah, um, for sure. Very similar to actually what, what Jensen's skill set uh, was outlined there. The only thing I would add is an understanding of, of uh, the not-for-profit sector um, building on, again, the community partnerships, uh, fundraising can be a part of the Crime Stoppers role um, in, in my position, not in particular with my program, do I do fundraising, but that's the beauty of Crime Stoppers is that each program is autonomous and has its own uh, flavor, if you will, mm -hmm. and there are some coordinators that do have to have a fundraising background, but uh, yeah, same, same as what, what you were saying, Jensen, the idea being that you know, being able to engage, communicate in a variety of, of formats. And certainly we've been challenged this past year in, in you know, pivoting from an in-person delivery to an online delivery and being effective in doing so. Um, a lot of writing and, and uh, personally, I have a journalism background, um, marketing, uh, photography, social media, that type of thing is very helpful. So that skill set, you know, is, is well applied in this role. But I have found, and, and Jensen, you know, may disagree, but in my role, I've learned so much as I've progressed in this role as well. So again, the, the, the relationships and the partnerships that are forged, and that brings another layer to the effectiveness of our program. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to that then, Jensen, if you don't mind the layered relationships um, uh, in some way, shape or form for us? Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, for sure. And I, yeah, I definitely agree that working 
with community partners and working with different agencies, you learn so much. So for example, we work with uh, community health centers who I've learned so much from around HIV AIDS and self-testing uh, as well as harm reduction. So I think working with other organizations, you might not come in with a specific skill set, uh, but you learn a lot from the organizations that you work with and also recognizing that um, as society changes and adapts, organizations must as well. Uh, and with the needs of our clients, we know that gender-based violence is not just a, a single-sided issue. And so we often dealing with people who are experiencing food insecurity, uh, a lack of housing uh, and mental health and addiction. So I think knowledge of those general issues uh, really comes with, with the territory as well and, and working with other community partners to help build that knowledge of how we can work together to, to work towards a better world for all. Mm -hmm. Awesome, uh, questions? Anyone at this point? No, we're good. Um, then Jensen, would you mind if I, uh, during COVID, um, what's been going on right now, have you, uh, could you kind of just speak to sort of what's been happening uh, with yourself in terms of support levels uh, during COVID and has there been a change at all? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're about a year anniversary from when we initially went into COVID and the first lockdown and reflecting on the year that we've had at our organization, it has been one of the toughest years uh, in our history and in for gender based violence and for a lot of community organizations, uh, in particular, because uh, we know that many folks who are experiencing gender-based violence may be living with their abusers, uh, and so this might change their ability to safely access support services. So whether that's the ability to privately and confidentially make a crisis phone call, uh, visit our website to get more information, attend an online or virtual appointment. So uh, the barriers to accessing services are higher than they've ever been um, for our clients who might be seeking support, uh, and that's something that we've tried to really adapt to be able to continue to deliver services online and remotely, but recognizing that there is a barrier there uh, with the need to access both internet, digital devices, and a private location to be able to attend something like an online appointment. Um, so the barriers are really high and the experiences, I would say, are, are more isolating uh, because we know that isolation is already a tactic that uh, abusers use it to gain power and control over their partners. Uh, but with the pandemic, we've all been much more isolated and isolated from even informal support, such as, as friends and families, um, such as a library and a safe space to go. So we've lost, uh, there's increased barriers when it comes to accessing supports um, and that isolation as well, even for the women who are in our shelter, there's normally, you know, social events and the ability to engage more with one another that kind of creates that sense of camaraderie that folks are in this together. And with uh, social distancing measures, we have uh, folks isolating to be able to maintain social distancing. So uh, that's been, been really tough as well. But I think our counselors from what we've seen too is that it's not just the crises that they're dealing with in terms of gender-based violence. It's a layered amount of crises that they're seeing. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, job and economic losses and that creating increased household stress. And when there's increased household stress, there may be uh, more severe and more intense levels of violence that are happening within the home. Uh, when you have children who are doing online learning at home, sometimes that can add increased levels of stress as well. Uh, and with the economic and job losses, we're seeing a lot more need uh, around food insecurity. We've been doing a lot of practical assistance through food and grocery gift cards. Uh, as well, we've seen uh, really big issues when it comes to accessing housing. Um, housing has always been something that's been difficult for uh, individuals to access, but I would say with COVID, it's, it's gotten worse as they're not able to quickly get into a safe and secure housing situation uh, because so many, especially congregate living settings like shelters um, are operating at such reduced capacity. So I would say for our clients and our staff, uh, this year during COVID has been an especially challenging one, uh, but has taught us a lot about the power of our communities and the ability to work together uh, as Sarah and I do often uh, to be able to collaborate and ensure that clients can access a multitude of services uh, through us and through other uh, organizations in our community. Wow, that beautifully said, really nice. Um, questions before I jump over to Sarah? Just jump in anytime, feel free. Um, Sarah, did you wanna to add to that point um, that Jensen was making? Yeah. 
Well, as far as our COVID impacts, you know, exactly the same thing. And, you know, I think it changed for everyone as far as Crime Stoppers is concerned. Uh, our, our main fundraising season is the spring. So we instantly had to shut down all of our fundraisers. Uh, and as a not-for-profit charitable organization, tremendous impact. Uh, I would say 75 to 85% of our fundraising was gone immediately with, with that announcement of, of physical distancing and, and public health uh, initiatives, rightfully so. Um, mm-hmm. However, the challenge for us was to keep ourself in the, the community uh, mindset and because with all the public health information that was being shared, again, important information, we know that crime didn't respect a pandemic. We knew that there was still crime taking place every day and we needed to make sure that we were still putting our messaging out there as again, a safe and anonymous confidential method of reporting crime an alternative to our police partners. So that really became the, the focus moving in throughout the year was how do we keep ourselves out there? So as far as challenges, uh, we saw our fundraising decrease. Uh, we, we saw our, our community engagement, you know, being able to do in-person presentations canceled. Um, so then the pressure became, we need to engage more with our social media and our website. And then we had to find a way to translate everything that we normally did in person and, and we're getting positive feedback on and put it in an online digital application. So by the time we got to, I'm going to say August, uh, we were able to have all of our content available, um, you know, being able to do you know, the web camera, the interaction, the Zoom platform or whatever video platform uh, was required. We were able to have that in place uh, by back to school time. And even though we weren't able to get into schools, we were ready to go into schools if we were able to um, from the school board perspective. Uh, that being said, uh, 2019 was a high watermark for us as far as tip volume. We had an excellent 2019. And when we did our year end stats for 2020, we were only 25 tips shy of our 2019 level. So what that tells me is, you know, if you want to look at it from a humorous standpoint, if you can find humor in these times, is people were locked up at home and they were reporting on things that they had not reported on in, in the past, you know, that they, they, they finally came forward and said things. Um, you know, they, we had people that were, uh, had a lot of time on their hands. We never saw our tip volume drop. It was consistent throughout the year. So I listened to my, my friends, you know, you know, Guelph Falling to Women in Crisis and other uh, agencies that, that have that social connection. And they've gone through such terrible times with, with the uh, ability or inability rather to engage with their, their community. And we're still hearing from our people because they can call us on the, the toll-free number. They can go through our website and provide a web tip. Our engagement was consistent. Um, but again, that being said, uh, it is still a challenge and, and I'm very appreciative that you've given us this opportunity to engage with your viewers so that we have that chance to maintain that viewership. But that's been the big struggle for Crime Stoppers is with, with all of the, the attention and the stress level toward public safety in the health realm, um, th- there hasn't been as, as much focus on crime prevention or crime reporting and, and we're trying to change that. Mm, yeah, that's also beautifully said. Thank you so much. Anya, do you have a question at all for any of our guests right now? I have a question. Yes, for Sarah. Maybe a Sarah? suggestion a question. Yep. Uh, I was thinking, like, uh, why don't we reach to the politicians, mayor, city councils, because they have a newsletter every month that they have a barbecue or something happen or whatever, right? I'm not going mm-hmm. against anything. I'm just saying, you know, something what they're doing in their in their areas, they should be promoting and bringing more awareness to the people, regular people, not the people who are already know you guys or know what's going on. A lot of people, they're not watching TV too much or not listening to the radio, what's going on around, they don't know. So at least they, they know that some emails are coming from the city. They should have some, some like uh, for the Sarah, you know, some couple mm-hmm. of lines. Hey guys, anything, let us know. We are with you. Something to make them more comfortable. Because what I noticed, because I'm in Markham, and whenever we do anything, we have uh, always support from the York Region Police, uh, 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 like uh, Peel Region Police. Like we, they all come, they bring the cars and stuff, involve, engage with the people, because that's very important. Because people have in their mind, mindset is that, oh, police is bad. Maybe uh, good and bad is everywhere. But not everybody's good and not everybody's bad. But that comfortable level, if it's good, you will see that everything will go down. No more, not too much crime. And these are the things that are important. 
every it it is it's not going to start from down it going to come from up so everybody from up to down have to be as, as a link as a team everybody newsletter they're sending the emails anyways right so if there's two three lines hey guys this is a number please call them any questions any problems not even fight anything you have a question in your mind whatever you know something so that's information should be i i'm thinking should be going out so not mm -hmm. in that way they were more comfortable mm -hmm. and do you think that that's um doing well in the Guelph Wellington region um uh, Sarah and Jensen do you think uh, the promotions and getting the knowledge out in the communities is there uh, oh, or there's sorry. lots more work to be done sorry I love yeah. your enthusiasm. I love that. I think that's amazing. And and a lot of times we do get that response from people when they understand what it is that we do. You can see the passion kind of flare up and that's very exciting to see. Uh, each, again, as I mentioned, each program operates differently. So in, in Guelph, Wellington, we certainly do have a, a, a terrific relationship. Uh, we are supported uh, both through Guelph Police Service and Wellington County OPP, um, you know, through, through their police services, but we also get tremendous support from the city of Guelph and the county of Wellington. And I think that's, that's really, it's so important as you pointed out, to have those relationships in place so that you can reach out to the mayor or, or the warden and say, I, I need some support here. We have an initiative that needs some attention and have them support you, whether it's a newsletter, whether it's on the website or whether they're tweeting about it. I mean, we all know our politicians are so active on social media. So I can't agree with you more. As far as other programs, uh, when I speak to other programs, I do sit as a member of the Ontario Association of Crime Stoppers as well as the Canadian Association of Crime Stoppers. I do urge them to engage with any possible partner. Um, my position is that really there is always an audience for Crime Stoppers because regardless of the topic, we can be talk talking about seniors, students, public vandalism. You know, there's a, a wide range of audiences for our program. So, it, you know, get out there and connect, whether it's your municipal partners, your regional partners, your provincial, your federal partners. And that's something we're doing at the, both the, the Ontario and, and Canada level with Crime Stoppers. But absolutely, it, it's something that I'm always looking for new opportunities. Uh, so if anyone's aware of, of someone that I should be talking to, please reach out to me through our website. Uh, we're always interested in, in having new partnerships and, and new connections with our municipal partners. See, that's why we believe in connect. You know, instead of blaming each other, let's connect and do something better. Instead of talk, 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 mm -hmm. there's no solution. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Sunil has got a great appreciation for the uh, police work and police association. He's very familiar with it from his background as well. Um, so uh, he can speak to that with quite a bit of knowledge. So he might share with you at this point uh, through the program. Thanks, Sunil. Appreciate that. Anya, question? Yeah, I have a question. Because of COVID, like, uh, like, how are you dealing with all these uh, domestic violence cases? Because I know it's been hard for like uh, people to, uh, like, uh, come to to uh, the organization in person. Like, how's it going now? Because I know before you were like, it could be done by uh, by uh, intake, but now like, how's how's the process now? Like, since it's changed because of COVID. Who wants to take that first? Sure. Yeah, I can I can take that on. So in terms of our like intake process. We've traditionally actually always done intake over the phone. Um, so that relatively has been an easy change for us as it's not much of a change in terms of the way that we've been doing things. What is a big change is normally we would do a lot of our uh, appointments in person. Uh, and now we're doing just in-person appointments for uh, high risk clients who couldn't meet with us uh, if they could not uh, meet in person. Uh, and obviously with social distancing and safety measures in place for that. Uh, but what has been challenging is um, the ability to do, as I mentioned earlier, an online appointment, as we know that not everyone has access to internet, digital devices, uh, a private place to have a call with one of our counselors. So that's been challenging because I think that there is a lot um, that comes from a face to face connection. Uh, I mean, I'm sure all of us are on Zoom and on computers talking to folks so much and it's so nice to see people's faces but when you're talking about your experiences with trauma you know it's so nice to be in a like warm space with someone um, to be able to share those experiences but what we have been trying to do and what we're doing right now is uh, we're doing a phone drive to help uh, folks access a refurbished uh, digital devices so they can make it easier for them to access online appointments as that's been something that has been challenging in terms of 
in terms of that. And I see someone mentioned language barriers as well. And something that we have always offered and will continue to offer is um, the availability to have interpretation. Um, that's something that we have for all of our appointments for folks who need it and have materials materials in different languages as well, but absolutely. And when you think of uh, who is more, uh, has more barriers to access uh, digital devices, we know that it is our more marginalized populations in society, uh, as well as when it comes to accessing appointments in appropriate languages and culturally relevant services. Uh, that is something that we're trying to, to deal with in terms of a barrier as well. Um, so yeah, in terms of what it's been challenging for getting people the supports they need, I think it's primarily just being able to connect with them. Uh, and we know that there's a lot of people right now who aren't able to reach out for support. So we've been trying to promote our crisis line in local newspapers, uh, get it into the hands of other service providers so that folks uh, can access that line as well for that more immediate support. That sounds interesting, the telephone mm -hmm. drive. I didn't know about that, that there's a thing called telephone drive until now, but that, that's very creative and, and interesting. Yeah, no, it really is. No, thank you so much. You, you guys are really great speakers. You really are. And so knowledgeable. We really appreciate you being here today and love that you jump around. Um, thank you very much for doing that in conversation. I wondered if you could speak to sort of the kids and, um, and the school system, if you don't mind, and uh, if uh, the layers of uh, involvement there that is required because kids have been at home. Um, and yes, accessing resources, but and perhaps uh, some of the challenges that lie around that. Um, Jensen, I don't know if you want to take that first, help us out there. Yeah, sure, I can do my best for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so for um, if children are in a home where there's abuse taking place that's either affecting them directly or indirectly, uh, we know that uh, abuse can affect children in different ways, um, such as creating anxiety and depression, uh, emotional distress, eating and sleeping disturbances, uh, low self-esteem, self-harm, um, difficulty concentrating. So we know that there's also many challenges when it comes to online learning. You know, online learning is not a one size fits all. Uh, some folks might have uh, different learning abilities or uh, different levels of comfort with technology. So being able to, you know, focus on online learning when you're in an abusive home, uh, I would imagine is an extra layer of challenging uh, beyond just the already existing challenges that exist for anyone who's doing online learning. Um, so I think that those challenges and not having those uh, safe spaces to uh, leave the abusive situation, such as going to school and having that removal and having that as a barrier to be a place where you can go where the abuse is not uh, affecting you directly or you're not hearing it or witnessing it uh, and being able to access you know supports that are available through the schools such as counselors um, and friends I think that that is I'm sure a huge impact on uh, those who are are learning from home uh, in an abusive home. Oh, well, thank you very much, Jensen. Appreciate that. Is there you want to tackle that one in terms of how, um, how it's affecting our children um, not having access to school? They're actually just back in right now in our region anyway. But I wondered if um, you can kind of speak to that and enlighten us in that area. Sure. So, so from our perspective, um, we normally go into schools and do presentations where we educate young people about what Crime Stoppers does, explain to them, get them young so they understand uh, how the program works. We also help drive home the, the idea of why it's important to report crime. Uh, you know, a lot of people have that idea of, you know, if it doesn't impact me, why should I care type thing. So we do talk about apathy and investment in the community and being a good community citizen. However, we haven't been able to get back into the school. So instead of of you know being frustrated with that what we've done is we've kind of flipped our messaging and encouraged people to talk to their their children their young people in their lives about their online engagement and, and i know this will tie into to some of the stuff that, that jensen does as well but you know there's a lot of online predators right now there's a lot of people that are connecting with our young people in a way that they shouldn't be and it's happening more frequently and we've seen an uptick in that as well as our domestic violence numbers so we've developed what we call a screen check and we just put a little reminder every couple of weeks just to say to parents or the adults in, in a young person's life, you know, to have a conversation with your child. 
ask them who they're talking to. Don't just, you know, be okay with the first answer, maybe sit down with them and go through their phone. Because we know, you know, whether it's it's um, abuse, or, or it's grooming for human trafficking, um, you know, severe bullying situations could easily be detected by taking a couple of moments, and just uh, discussing why it's important to know who they're communicating with, and what those people have uh, for their intentions. We've also been able to work with uh, one of our partners through the internet, or sorry, yes, the internet child exploitation unit with Guelph Police Service. And, and he's an expert on this and, and uh, Constable Hugh Curry is his name and we've been so proud to work with him and help increase awareness. Again, people don't know what's happening and they think screen time is, is a great way to deal with the downtime that we've had. And, and frustratingly, that's not been the case. And we know that, that young people are being um, approached in a variety of ways at, at numbers we haven't seen before. So again, we don't necessarily, um, or we can't necessarily get into the classroom right now, but we're trying to find a different way to engage with young people. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much for that. Very prevalent. Coming from the teaching background myself, I, I know how important that is to, as you said, uh, getting it very, very young, um, actually as early as you can, you know, and, and drive it into the sort of the core of who we are as, as uh, citizens and human beings, right? Um, uh, so I, I'm just going to see if Anya has a question. I know she's uh, in the background. She's quite a, a busy gal, kind of jumping around from different different activities. Any questions at all, Anya? I'm just listening. It's a thank great uh, discussion. I'm just listening. No, thank you for even being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Um, You're welcome. Last you. time it was hard for me because I had another meeting coming up. That's why I couldn't stay for long. But that, like all the sessions, like by Moksha and Needs for Change, are just amazing. That I, I just wish I could keep attending. So I'm going to try to attend awesome. next week Thanks. as well. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And it really is a moment in time with um, everyone that's attending, our guests, our guest experts, and uh, just learning and growing along the way. And really, that is what Moksha Canada Foundation is about. And might I say, my name is Lynn McAtee. I'm the host of um, Spotlight on Community. And we are going to be um, carrying on with our conversation about domestic violence. A question from Anya. Any questions at all about how important it is for kids to have access uh, to resources during these times? Uh, I don't have any questions, but it's a really interesting discussion, so I'm just listening. Awesome. Okay. And we can, uh, Sarah, would you mind speaking about then resources in terms of not-for-profit for yourself and how important that is? And like, where is the money coming from then uh, during these times? Um, how do you do that? Excellent question. Um, the way we're structured in Guelph Wellington is part of the support we get from our police partners is, is my role in particular. I'm a Wellington County OPP civilian employee and I'm assigned to Crime Stoppers. So there's, there's no wage uh, incurred for the program. Uh, I have a colleague, she is the office coordinator. So she's the person that you would talk to 90% of the time for your tips. And her wage is covered through a uh, financial uh, contribution by Guelph Police Service, so through City of Guelph. So there is no wage that comes out of Crime Stoppers. Um, our, our, we're, we're working from home right now, but uh, traditionally we were housed by the County of Wellington, so we did not have overhead for a building. So there was no lease or office expenses that way. So really the cost that we had um, were to you know make sure we had promotional materials you know things with our logos on it uh, engagement for the community uh, we do have a vehicle it is paid for and uh, the the costs for that vehicle are covered by Wellington County OPP most graciously uh, so fuel oil changes that type of thing what it comes down to is is we are able to tell people that want to support crime stoppers that the majority of their donation goes directly into paying either tips or rewards or into uh, program promotion, which is so important because as we mentioned earlier, if people don't know about the program, they can't use the program. So uh, we're, we're able to maximize your donation dollar uh, in that way. That being said, you know, we never know from month to month uh, what the, the rewards are going to look like. Uh, for example, in our area, we have five outstanding homicides currently. So if someone came forward and said that they had information, you know, five people came forward, they had information that could solve those five crimes. Uh, we could be looking at a maximum payout of $2,000 for each of those tips. So we know, have to know that we have $10,000 available to us to pay out those rewards. That being said, a majority of our tipsters don't really provide their tip information for the cash reward, even though that's how we've been created and, and, and the premise of our program since it was uh, first uh, developed in 1976. However, 
we know that we have that obligation that we promote it as being part of our program. So we have to make sure that we have the ability to pay out rewards. Some months, there's no rewards paid out. Other months, it can be several hundreds or thousands of dollars, depending on, you know, how it's worked with an investigator with that information and, and uh, the success of, a, of an investigation with that tip. So it's hard to budget for that. We always have a fundraising mindset. We never look at it and say, well, we don't have to worry about fundraising next month. There's always opportunities um, for engagement that leads to fundraising. And I can do a shameless plug right now, if you give me a second. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> we, we are currently doing uh, face masks because that is uh, the fashion statement that we are all having to deal with. And uh, with a minimum $15 donation, you can go to our website at www.csgw.tip. See, you were as you were looking for that information. I know you are. Um, but, but for a minimum donation of $15, which really covers the cost of the mask, covers the cost of mailing it to you because we we're trying to limit our in-person uh, interactions and gives a little donation to Crime Stoppers. And that's just one example of being creative during these challenging times. We are hoping, you know, if things in our area continue to go in a positive way that we'll be able to do some measure of, of interactive fundraising, as long as it's distance and safe for everyone, both our customers and our volunteers. So we're hoping that that's gonna be the case. Uh, we do mulch sales in the spring. so. You know, like I said, oh a year ago, we were all excited, ready to go outside and, and then everything shut down and there was no way we could do that event with, with the restrictions that were in place at that time. So yeah, fundraising, tremendous uh, obstacle for us uh, at the best of times. We do have a limited amount of government support that is only going towards our after hours phone service. So, you know, after four o'clock in the afternoon, um, we, we have an after hour service that takes the calls because we can't be there all the time to answer the phone. And uh, again, that's just a portion of, of the cost that we have to run our program. Outside of that, we've, we've got everything from fundraisers. We have people that, that flat out make donations to our organization. We have uh, businesses and community organizations that are, are very supportive of the Crime Stoppers messaging and they may partner with us on anything from road signs um, to a specific dedicated initiative that we partner with them on. You know, get creative and come up with something unique to, uh, specific to what their needs are. And we're always mm -hmm. looking for those opportunities too because again, it's a new audience and it's increasing the awareness and spreading the message. Right on. So you, know, you had a question regarding the, the face mask originally. You were going to make a point yeah, or have a question? Uh, one question I was just thinking, because I just mm -hmm. mentioned before also, that mm -hmm. uh, the main thing what uh, as a normal person, what I see, a lot of people know about you guys, but a lot of people don't know what you guys do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how they can involve with you. Because lack of awareness, lack of information is there. They know. 800 some tips, even I don't know, 800 some, you know, some tip, whatever. I'm just saying general mm -hmm. as a normal person. So that's what I was talking about. We should like, everybody wants to do something, but everybody's doing it their own different ways. If we all come mm -hmm. together, doesn't matter all the nonprofit organization because mm -hmm. they're nonprofit. That means they want to do something good for the community. Yeah. Doesn't matter whatever uh, place, whatever things they want to do better but they want to do something better for the community. So in that's the reason I was thinking, we all should have come together like Canada Post, right? Mm -hmm. Like you said the mask, I was happy, okay, I, I want one mask, right? I'm just, you know, and, and masks must, must have a phone number or something, I'm just saying, you know, like that. So you said, oh, $15 there and then $10 shipping charges. They should be partnered with, with like these kind of things, for the community, for the Canadian people, everybody, doesn't matter, whatever. And cheaper price for these kind of things. So then more awareness. And they're, they're, that's what we are looking for. Like even, I'm, I'm not saying any, like any leaders, when they say be something, only 30, 40, 50 people are there. So out of 50, maybe 20 people listen what they're saying, but that thing is done, finished. It should go everywhere. More people know the more better. That's what my concern is. That's what my, you know, what I see as a normal person, that's what it is. And when like, there are so many seniors, they walk around in the evening, like not now, like before, they see a lot of things too, but they don't know what to do. 
how to call who to call we need to involve those things that's it no, that's a good point, actually. And it's interesting because from community to community, um, if you even just look at, say, Crime Stoppers, for example, um, and how does that um, morph from one community to another? Is there the same mantra, the same mandate? I think the underlying core themes are the same, right? Um, most likely, I would think. Um, so Mar Markham, for example, um, Crime Stoppers um, division there. Um, I would hope that there is an umbrella to pull everybody in. And as you spoke of earlier, Sarah and Sunila as well, just pulling everyone together and, and, and not reinventing the wheel, so to speak. Right. Um, yeah. Is that what you, yeah, no, for sure. And uh, Sunil has a um, police background as well. So that's his, oh. uh, yes. He might tell you more through the program. <laughs> um, but well, yes, I can no, that's say, a, what, what region is Mark in? Just, just refresh my memory. Uh, Jacques region. York Region. I can tell you there's a very active program in York Region. I actually know the coordinator uh, personally, and I can tell you that the Canadian president for Crime Stoppers is uh, his home program is in York Region. So you are well represented and uh, they have great support with with York Regional Police as well. I know that, too. Uh, and, and you know what? You, everything you bring up, I, I'm smiling. Smiling and nodding because you know, I to speak because, you know, and Jensen and I have, have a similar problem in that, uh, you know, we're never going to be out of work as long as crimes are being committed and as long as there's somebody who doesn't know what we do, right, Jensen? Like that's, that seems to be, that's what we're doing is, is educating, creating awareness, providing the opportunities to connect. And just what we're doing here right now is, is amazing for that. Um, and again, so very appreciative for the opportunity, but I think that's where, uh, you know, as a member of the community, a normal person, as you're putting it, uh, that's where, you know, you take a moment and, you know, you just Google it, look up your local Crime Stoppers program and, and do a little bit of research. And it, it's a rabbit hole. Let me tell you, you'll learn about your local program and the initiatives that they are adopting because it's different with every program. But you're absolutely correct, Lynn, in that we all have the same philosophy. We all have anonymous, confidential reporting. If you're not comfortable dealing directly with police, you have Crime Stoppers as your middleman and uh, all tips are forwarded to the police. So you have this, this this organization that is giving you another opportunity to do the right thing in your community and make it a safer community and, and, and allow us to partner with, you know, initiatives like domestic violence and, and shed light on that. So I, I totally agree with you. And, and I think we're on the same wavelength, but if I could say anything, it would be just take a moment and regardless of where you are, find your local program, learn what they're doing and, and maybe volunteer and get invested. Well, that's actually a great point. No question? Yes. No, no, same thing, same topic, because while she was talking, so I'm thinking all, all the scenarios and everything. Like yeah. Google, okay, I can do Google. We all can do Google. A lot of people, they're not Google people. No. That's the Fair one enough. thing. And second thing I was thinking about is about the, like, a lot of people, they're scared. I, I have no idea. Like, you guys are there to protect, to save the people whoever they are, but a lot of people, they're scared to call the police or even, even they have a problem in the family, like somebody's fighting, beating or whatever. Kids are, it's not about always husband and wife, it's a lot of other things are also kids, you know, whatever, senior parents or whatever. Something is happening, most of the people, you know, normal thing, but it's not normal, I'm just saying, sorry. Uh, people even scared at that time to call 911 because they, they say, what I heard from some people that if I call 911, they're gonna arrest, they're gonna ruin our days, days, days. Instead of solving us, even instead of helping our problem, they're gonna create more problem for us. This is what I hear from people. So that thing should be changed. Doesn't matter this way or that way. You know what I'm saying? Police people are scared from police instead of respecting the police. That's what people are going towards. You know, like they're they like. I'm just saying what I see and hear, right? Like it should be respect. Like police come, they say, yes, I, confident. I want to tell you what happened. When police come, they say, oh, say away. Maybe they, he gonna arrest me. You know, this is what the mentality, that's why people are away, even though they they know a lot of crime, a lot of stuff in the, in the community, but they're stay, staying behind because of one of the, I think this is the reason. So that's it. It's interesting. No, thank you, Suno. I appreciate that. Because in the next part of the program, actually, in our next segment, we'll be talking about accessibility in terms of how do we permeate the school system for these resource conversations and things that are accessible to families and children and, and such, and not just have it be um, topical. 
Um, so absolutely, I totally get what you're saying for sure. Um, I wondered if before we end uh, this segment, uh, if there's, a, so I don't know, Sarah, did you wanna address that from uh, Sunil or Jensen? Uh, and maybe I'll get a question from Anya and then we can kind of wrap up this segment and then pick up the second part where people can join us the following week uh, to kind of zero in on resources and accessibility and making change positively. I, I would like to jump on because I think that's a great opportunity right there that, that you brought up to say, you know, we we're talking about domestic violence this this session, but really Crime Stoppers is, is designed for any type of crime in any community anywhere. And, and maybe this is a good opportunity to kind of, you know, give you a little snapshot of how the process works, because again, we have wonderful relationships with our police partners, but we're here because we know not everyone does, frankly, and our police partners know that, that we talk to that. So, it, you know, as far as the, the process, you're absolutely correct. If there's something happening in a household, uh, say a, a child is seeing something happening with their parents or, uh, and when we say domestic violence, you know, primarily we're speaking of, you know, a, a husband and a wife or people in an in a intimate or romantic relationship, but it could be, you know, a family dynamic as well for domestic violence, right? So, it, you know, another member of the family could easily reach out and contact Crime Stoppers because they can't call the police because they can't be known as the person that reached out uh, for that type of intervention. Maybe they're fearful for their own safety. They're fearful for the victim's safety. There's a lot of dynamics with these types of situations. And that's where Crime Stoppers is, again, uniquely positioned as anonymous. And what that really means is no one knows that you've contacted us. We don't know that you've contacted us. Your information is confidential. We don't share information broadly and say, we just got this tip from you know this person. We keep that confidential. Every tip that we get to our program is forwarded to our police or investigative partners. So you know that if you contact us, we don't sit on information, especially something as serious as domestic violence. We know how important it is to get that information forwarded. So, you know, while we're not doing the frontline work that Jensen and, and Guelph Wellington Women in Crisis are doing, what we're trying to do is stop it. We're trying to, to you know, end that cycle or end the continuity of the crime. So I just wanted to take a moment and kind of spell that out because I, I, I fully agree with what you're saying. And I think the big misconception is that people see this logo and they think they know what Crime Stoppers is and they really don't understand how serious we are about anonymity and confidentiality. So I'll, I'll shut it down and let, and let Jensen speak to that now as well. Nice one, thank you. Jensen? Yeah, sure, that was really well, well put, Sarah. And I think uh, Sarah and I actually did a session uh, last week around domestic violence and we had some representatives from uh, the Guelph Police Service and the Wellington OPP. And part of why we brought them on and Crime Stoppers was to talk about you know, if you're someone who's experiencing domestic violence and you call the police or you call crime stoppers, what can you expect to happen? And I think breaking that down of like what will happen. And one of the things that stuck with me is that uh, one of the uh, representatives that we had from Guelph Police mentioned that when you call 911 uh, and it's around domestic violence, the support doesn't end at that call. And so from there, they're finding ways to connect you with other supports in the community, uh, such as Guelph Wine Tumor in Crisis or giving you information about Crime Stoppers. Uh, and so I think that that breaking down the misconceptions for folks too of like what actually does happen when you call the police, because I think that um, having fears about calling the police is 100% valid and we know um, that if we can find ways to break down those barriers uh, and to support in a report, uh, making sure that they could do so safely, anonymously, and with supports from other community partners. No, that's amazing. Um, thank you so much. You're both beautifully said um, from both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, Anya, do you have any questions? Um, we're going to be kind of wrapping up the segment. Um, sort of no, I don't have any questions. It's, it's, it was an amazing session. I, I learned a lot. Yeah, no, thank you for that. And in part two of the segment, we'll kind of just breaking down barriers, we'll pick up on that conversation for our viewers who may not join us for the first session, but get an opportunity to join us for the second one. Question from you, Sunil. I just have a question for Hania. Mm -hmm. yes. Hania, what do you think about whatever we talk about? What do you think? Do you want to feedback something? Your experiences, your ideas or something? Well, we I would say that the uh, really interesting thing what I found was like um, educating children about domestic violence. Like I felt like that's a, that's a new concept, and I think that that should be uh, that should be in the curriculum more often. And also on top of that, like uh, as you mentioned, like the more partnerships you have, and um, 
the more resources you have, it's good to get the people connected right away. And the telephone drive, that was amazing. I didn't know that there was a thing called telephone drive until now. So that was really amazing. You know what? Pass it on. That's how it goes, right? And you share these wonderful ideas and everyone's shining light on these fantastic yeah. Yeah, initiatives. I will share yeah. my network for sure because there's always like... Um, like uh where I want to hear like I'll always find like there's always gonna be women who are probably dealing with something so it's good to bring out these resources oh big time for sure and that, it's conversations it really is just that these moments together go ahead Sneo sorry I was just saying that is a reason we want to do these kind of programs mm -hmm. so like the basic things not the big things what people all mm -hmm. over they're talking on the local things like people like touch the people involve the local people that's what important when they know, then everybody know in the family. You know, like not talk, talk, talk the general things, but basic things. You know, that's the reason we start this this program called Spotlight on Community to bring like take out the things, what questions people have, basic questions, right? Like they don't ask other people, but that's what we are trying to do here. True. No, that's I, awesome. That's a really great initiative. Mm -hmm. It is, and it's about breaking down the barriers, as we were all talking about, but the taboos as well, that people are fearful of talking about, as you were referring to as well, Sunil. Um, we are coming to the end of our program for the sec uh, session one, uh, talking about domestic violence and community resources with uh, Jensen and Sarah. I wondered if we could wrap up today and invite our viewers to come back for the following week to join us with domestic violence and reminding our viewers that we are Moksha Canada Foundation. My name is Lynn McEntee. I've been your host and I've been delighted actually to, to learn and grow from our experts today that have been here with us. Uh, they're going to be joining us for the next portion of the program. And I want to remind our viewers to reach out to us if you have an idea for a show. Please reach out on social media to mokshacanada.com or you can reach any of us at info at mokshacanada.ca as well. I uh, look forward to seeing you in the next session. Again, my name is Lynn McEntee. Thank you to all of our guests. Thank you, Jensen, for joining us for session one of domestic violence. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. And thank you, Anya and Sunil, for joining us as well. Look forward to seeing you hopefully for the next session.